Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review for Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Before I get started, what I will say is there are going to be spoilers galore in this review, and honestly, having read this and being heavily, heavily spoiled for it myself, I would say uh, if you ever plan to read this book and you haven't read it yet, stop watching. Even the cover of my edition is a spoiler. So that's why I haven't hold, held it up yet. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, let me read you the blurb here. Last night, I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. Working as a lady's companion, the heroine of Rebecca learns her place. Her future looks bleak until, on a trip to the south of France, she meets Max de Winter, a handsome widower whose sudden proposal of marriage takes her by surprise. She accepts, but whisked from glamorous Monte Carlo to the ominous and brooding Mandalay, the new Mrs. De Winter finds Max a changed man, and the memory of his dead wife Rebecca is forever kept alive by the forbidding housekeeper, Mrs. Danvers. Not since Jane Eyre has a heroine faced such difficulty with the other woman. An international bestseller that has never gone out of print, Rebecca is the haunting story of a young girl consumed by love and the struggle to find her identity. So, right, where do I begin with this? Alright, well first of all apparently it is a retelling of, of Jane Eyre, or an adaptation of it or something like that. I don't know, I've never read Jane Eyre, so I can't comment on that. I will also say, yes, the young girl, the main character in this, is very much consumed by love and the struggle to find her identity, because she just doesn't have an identity. This entire book is basically about her trying to fill Rebecca's shoes. And, um, alright, well, I guess we'll start getting to the spoilery filled bits. So this has got an introduction by Sally Bowman, who I find has written an award-winning Rebecca's Tale, authorised by the De Maurier estate. Yeah, I'm not going to be reading that because Sally Bowman spoiled the majority of the book for me. So her introduction, it's not really an introduction, it's basically a detailed synopsis of everything that happens in this story. Including the fact that Max de Winters murdered Rebecca. I didn't know that. I thought she had died naturally. What else did it say? I knew, so the bit that I said the cover spoiled for me, right at the very end, on the last page, Mandalay is burnt down by a fire. The, the, the introduction makes it clear that the start of the book is written in like a post Mandalay world after Rebecca and Max can't go back. And then you've got this cover, which looks a lot like a fire. <laughs> so, I before I'd even actually started reading the book, I, I thought there's probably going to be a fire near the end. There was. It happened on the very last page. And I'm just like, oh, I think that was supposed to be a surprise. So, yeah, that didn't work. The fact that Max de Winter killed his wife, well, Sally Bowman ruined that for me as well. And then as well, another thing is that going into this, I know quite a lot of, like, pop culture references to Rebecca, and one of them in particular is from Mitchell and Webb, the comedy duo. I'm going to flout copyright laws very slightly here, and we're going to claim it's fair usage. And I'll show you a bit of their sketch that they did based on Rebecca. And basically, the idea behind the sketch is that it follows Rebecca, and instead of being obsessed with Rebecca, Max de Winter is obsessed with his second wife, the second Mrs. de Winter. But for example, because of what you're about to see, I was totally spoiled about the dress scene as well, when Mrs. Danvers is like, oh yes, you should wear the dress in that portrait. And I'm like, well, okay. I'm sorry, dear, I was thinking about a time when we'll be playing tennis. How, how she will love tennis. So that's why I'm not allowed on the court. I'm surprised you didn't keep the boating lake for her as well. Oh, no. We'll never use the lake once you're gone. She'll find it too upsetting. Besides, people will say it's haunted. in the portrait? The portrait of the second Mrs. De Winter. <sighs> so this is a buddy read with Erin from The Bibliotherapist, Sophisticated Books, and then Lou G and Patrice Jones, and those last two uh, booktube viewers but don't have their own channels. So the buddy reading aspect of it was good. I actually even said in our email trail, I was like, it's a good job I'm doing this buddy read because I'm getting to see like the blind perspective, you know, people are emailing back and forth, for example, their first thoughts on uh, Mandalay, the estate, and they said it sounded really beautiful, and I'm like, it sounds haunting and desolate to me, but that's possibly because I know what happened on the bloody lake. Jesus. 
there were two bits of this that I wasn't spoiled for. And those two bits were, first off, Rebecca had cancer. It's like, oh, okay. So she was dying anyway. And so she somehow tricked Max into murdering her, which I wasn't expecting. But it also, it, it just felt too convenient to me. The other bit was the fact that Max de Winter actually hated Rebecca and had never liked her, which I didn't know because it's kind of not really explained in that way. But the reason he didn't like her was the same reason that I, as a reader, didn't like Rebecca. I was like, nah, she seems too perfect. There's something wrong here. Like, I don't, and I don't like people that, like, portray themselves as Rebecca portrayed herself as well. Because I genuinely think that in the vast majority of cases when people portray themselves like that, it's because they're not like that. I can... T th <laughs> also, right, <laughs> another problem that we have that now I've read this is that Gone Girl, isn't that just pretty much a retelling of this? It's basically the same... It's basically the same plot. My feelings on this, uh, if I'd gone into this totally blind, knew nothing about it, it would be a guaranteed 5 out of 5, possibly my book of the year. But because I was so heavily spoiled, I mean, don't get this edition, the Varego Modern Classics edition. If you do, don't read the introduction. And the introduction was only like, it was like 10 pages, and she manages to ruin pretty much every major plot point in the story. It was just... <sighs> Luckily, Du Maurier's writing saved it, so... Uh, it, it was a good book and I can like I say if you knew nothing about it. It would blow your mind It's very well written. It's just my personal enjoyment of it was kind of hampered quite considerably What I do find interesting is the and this is the one good thing from the introduction is that uh, Bowman says that well, I'll read it out and this is quite similar to Agatha Christie and how she felt and I will link as well to my Review of her autobiography because that's that's my source for this. So this is about De Maurier anyway Throughout her life, she was torn between the need to be a wife and the necessity of being a writer, and she seems to have regarded those roles as irreconcilable. Half accepting society's and her husband's interpretation of ideal womanhood, yet rebelling against it and rejecting it, she came to regard herself as a half-breed who was unnatural. To her, both her lesbianism and her art were a form of aberrance. They both sprang, she believed, from a force inside her that she referred to as the boy in the box. Sometimes she fought against this incubus, and sometimes she gloried in him. We have a, uh, just a throwaway reference to a painting where the eyes follow you around from the frame, and I thought that was a bit cliche, but I'll let De Maurier get away with it, seeing as this was published in 1938. I mean, this is before Scooby-Doo, so you, you can get, let her get away with that, I guess. This is the closest we get to knowing what the protagonist's name is as well, because she's a nameless protagonist. She's also a very unreliable and unlikable narrator. So, uh, anyway, Max de Winters says, I told you at the beginning of lunch you had a lovely and unusual name. I shall go further, if you will forgive me, and say that it becomes you as well as it became your father. I've enjoyed this hour with you more than I've enjoyed anything for a very long time. You've taken me out of myself, out of despondency and introspection, both of which have been my devils for a year. It's interesting that even then, when he refers to her name, it's in the context that it's her father's name, it's her surname. She's just, I'm trying to think of how you would describe the protagonist. She does get better towards like the second half of the book when she finds out her husband killed his last wife. By the way, her husband shot the last wife and apparently there's no signs of that in the autopsy. I think that, I guess he must have shot her through the stomach or something where there's no bone because I, because she was underwater for ages and stuff so I get that her flesh or whatever would have gone away, but surely the bullet would have still, like, hit something. But, but, but no, apparently not. I don't know, in all the parodies and stuff I've seen, it's always presented as though Max doesn't like the second Mrs. De Winter, but actually, he does. That's why he married her. He married her because she wasn't Rebecca, and, like, he was hoping for some normality, and he did actually like her. He hated his first wife, liked his second wife. And even from my read, I never get that Max doesn't like the second Mrs. De Winter. I get that maybe he's a bit cold and aloof, but then he has little in common with her. He's, you know, in his 40s. And this is a big problem that I had is that Max De Winter and even Mrs. Uh, Danvers, I found to be more likable characters than the protagonist. And I think they're meant to be the bad guys, like the, pro the, the antagonists. Yeah, so for example, again, I said the, the other people I buddy read with, they said that that Mandalay sounded nice. And I think this is the first time we're introduced to it here, this paragraph. And it does not sound nice to me at all. The drive twisted and turned as a serpent, scarce wider in places than a path, 
and above our heads was a great colonnade of trees whose branches nodded and intermingled with one another, making an archway for us like the roof of a church. Even the midday sun would not penetrate the interlacing of those green leaves. They were too thickly entwined, one with another, and only little flickering patches of warm light would come in intermittent waves to dapple the drive with gold. It was very silent, very still. It just sounds like there's no light there, there's no movement. It just sounds like death to me. And even the wording of it, that the, 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 the driveway, you know, wound like a serpent. It doesn't sound welcoming at all. And I think that's deliberate. But it, it's just interesting that the others thought that, that Mandalay did sound welcoming. And I thought it just... I mean, I would hate to live there, I think. It was just... It was like big and empty and not alive. Like, it was like as though the building had died when Rebecca did, you know. I mean, there's stuff here, so I can't remember who this is that said this. Possibly Beatrice. And she says, uh, you don't sail by any chance, do you? No, I said. Thank God for that, she said. Which is some nice foreshadowing if you don't know how Rebecca died. But again, <laughs> I don't know. It's weird. I've never read a, read something like this where it feels like a reread. And I'm just looking at all this foreshadowing. And I'm like, well, it almost felt, I don't know, a bit clunky and artificial to me because I knew what was going to happen. We have this bit when Mrs. De Winter accidentally smashes an ornament and tries to hide it in a drawer and they're like, well, that's what a maid would do. And it's, I don't know, it was, it was kind of cute because it kind of gave you a sense of the time this was written, I suppose. I don't know, it just made me dislike that character even more. I'm like, fucking own up to your mistakes. Jesus Christ, you're supposed to be the lady of the house. And it is done with a purpose, but at the same time, it's super infuriating as a reader. Oh, then they go to see, is it his, it's Max De Winter's mother or grandmother? Oh no, it's Beatrice's grandmother. I'm not entirely sure who Beatrice was, so uh, I can't really remember, but uh, but anyway, they, they go to see her with the new Mrs. De Winter and this old lady. She's just like, I want Rebecca! What have you done with Rebecca? Where is Rebecca? Why did not Maxim come and bring Rebecca? It, I don't think it was ever really clarified what that was about. I think maybe she was supposed to have dementia or something like that. We have a point in this when a character asks whether cancer is contagious. We have this bit as well, again a little bit of foreshadowing and it's like, why does Maxim not like uh, Rebecca's cousin? Now I did not predict it was because the two of them were having sex, but only because in today's day and age, you'd find it a bit weird if cousins were having sex, but I suppose it was reasonable at that time. But uh, yeah, then it turns out that he wanted to marry her and stuff. I'm just like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh yeah. And then Giles. He, he's like, uh, oh, I'm coming as an Arabian sheik. Good God, said Maxim. It's not at all bad, said Beatrice warmly. She now says a bunch of stuff that would be considered inappropriate these days. He stains his face, of course, and leaves off his glasses. The headdress is authentic. We borrowed it off a friend who used to live in the East, and the rest the tailor copied from some paper. Giles looks very well in it. So we get to this bit as well, and this is where Maxim de Winter kind of admits what's going on. It's Rebecca's body lying there on the cabin floor, he said. No, I said, no. The woman buried in the crypt is not Rebecca, he said. It's the body of some unknown woman, unclaimed, belonging nowhere. There never was an accident. Rebecca was not drowned at all, I killed her. I shot Rebecca in the cottage in the cove. I carried her body to the cabin and took the boat out that night and sunk it there, where they found it today. It's Rebecca who's lying dead there on the cabin floor. Will you look into my eyes and tell me that you love me now? And apparently, yes, she will look into his eyes and tell him that she loves him because she doesn't really care that he murdered his ex-wife. It's all fine. Then they have like a court session where they have a like a hearing about this body. And then Mrs. De Winter faints in the middle of it at a very obvious point at which you would think, oh, she must know something. But no, apparently, no, because she's a woman, you see. So women faint all the time. So <laughs> that's not what I believe, by the way. It's just what's sort of implied by the... <laughs> by the narrative. Yeah, then we have this twist where it turns out that she was having sex with her cousin. That's right near the end as well. And it's kind of like, well, I don't know. It's a bit, it's a bit Clary and Jace, isn't it? What I did quite like is they, they find this number 0488 and a letter next to it, an M. And they realize the M means it's a telephone exchange. So it must be London. So it's either Mayfair or Museum. And it turns out to be museum, so they're able to get hold of this dude. Let me have down here Maxim right at the end. I believe, said Maxim, that Rebecca lied to me on purpose. The last supreme bluff. She wanted me to kill her. She foresaw the whole thing. That's why she laughed. That's why she stood there laughing when she died. I don't know. I don't know about that. I just don't... 
maybe in the in the time again this was written when maybe it was considered you know you weren't supposed to get a divorce or whatever but I don't oh and then it's because basically Rebecca's put in all of this acting and stuff where she's kind of pretended that they're the perfect couple and all this lot so she's like well you can't leave me now because everybody will think it's you and not me or whatever so that's I think why he killed her but I don't know. Again, especially knowing that that Mandalay was going to burn down, or at least having a very strong guess that Mandalay was going to burn down at the end, it it almost doesn't didn't seem to matter to me. It's like, well, he might still might as well have left her because he would have maybe lost Mandalay, but he lost that anyway. So all in all, I mean, again, I do think the twists and turns in this and the way it's written would combine to make it a five star book if you didn't know anything about it. But now that you've watched this review, I basically ruined that for you. Sorry about that. I did give you a warning at the start of the video. It's one of the few books that I've read where actually I do think that my reading experience was like dramatically hampered by the fact that I knew what was going to happen because I think that was kind of the point of it. So that's a shame. But still, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give it a four out of five based on De Maurier's writing style. Like the writing itself was fantastic. Characterization was great. The fact that I didn't like the characters hampered my enjoyment of it. But what can you do? It is what it is. I mean, I'm glad I buddy read it. I'm glad I can say this has now been read. I just wish it hadn't been a spoil for me, predominantly by the cover and the introduction, but also by popular culture. So anyway, that's what I thought of Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.